hello. Today, we're not talking about exercise. We're not talking about eating better. None of those things. What we are talking about is having fun by being interested in the world and how using our brain can lead to better brain health. This idea of cognitive reserve and how you can promote it in your own life. It's the fall of 1989 and I'm a 15 year old clueless kid. I'm the youngest of a huge Minnesota farm family, a family of eight. And you might think that we're like the Brady Bunch, you know, giggling and having fun and adventures and all this closeness and talking to our parents and hanging out with our grandparents and <laughs> all these wonderful things. It's not exactly like that. In fact, I don't really know my grandparents other than seeing them at family dinners once in a while. But because I had been recently granted my farm permit at age 15, and yes, it's true, you don't really need much more than a farm permit and this idea that you should be able to drive and maybe a few skills that you pick up on a riding lawnmower. Um, but I was chosen to go in and help my grandparents. They lived in a tiny little farm town about seven miles from the family farm and they needed more help. My grandfather had Parkinson's disease. He was having problems with movement, getting dressed, navigating the world. My grandmother was legally blind. She had diabetes. She was confined to a wheelchair and they needed assistance with just everyday tasks. So bright and early, my very first day before school, I show up at their house and immediately I am tasked with helping my grandfather put on his depends and get dressed. And yeah, it was, it was a shock. It was, <laughs> it was hard. I'm 15. I've seen nothing in the world. Um, but I figure it out. I figure out how to help people get dressed and help them move more effectively, how to transfer from a wheelchair to a toilet and back again. I figure out with very few cooking skills, which is surprising. My mother is an amazing cook. All of my sisters, Actually, several of my brothers <laughs> all are great in the kitchen. Um, but I was of the vein of uh, everybody else is doing that. I don't want to do learn how to do those things. So I took my basic cooking skills and I figured out how to make hot cereal on the stove and how to cut up a grapefruit. So I did those things. But it wasn't so much the life skills I was learning, but it was more so the connection that I was making. I was falling in love with my grandparents and my grandfather passed away, but my grandmother lived and she thrived. I'm not saying she thrived because she was the picture of physical health. She wasn't, but she thrived from what she did with her brain. She was a, a beautiful piano player, a piano teacher. And yes, when I was young, I had been taking piano lessons, although not necessarily uh, willingly or enthusiastically. But she continued to play even though she couldn't see the music. She wanted to learn. And so since there weren't a lot of books back then that were audio books that she could listen to, she would ask me to read. And we would read amazing things. We'd be reading about quantum mechanics or whatever. And we would run into something we didn't know. And she'd go, what does this mean, Amy? And I would very honestly say, I don't know, Grandma. <laughs> and she would say, go get the dictionary. And I would run and get the actual physical book, the dictionary. I don't know that many people have dictionaries today. <laughs> um, but we'd get it and we'd look it up and we would learn about new things and we would talk about what we were learning and we would come up with new questions about other things we didn't understand. My grandmother was thriving despite her physical limitations and she's the inspiration for what we're talking about today. We're here to celebrate the research that says why she was doing so well. The research that says even when you don't want to do or can't easily do the number one way to promote neuroplasticity, aerobic exercise, and I have a video on that, 
But when you're not in that headspace or as a complement to that type of activity, there is another way to promote neuroplasticity. Another way to promote neuroplasticity is through novel learning or doing something new or using your brain in ways that are cognitively stimulating. Now, what most people think of when they are blessed enough to have free time is they think, oh, I should have a hobby. I like hobbies, I'm no hobby hater, but by definition, a hobby is find something you like and do it over and over again. And that's great. If you have a hobby or you're interested in a hobby, please do pick up your hobby and do it over and over again. But what the research suggests is that it's also important to do new things, to do different things, to diversify and have an array of things that you're interested in and you like to do. So let's look at the research. You know I love meta-analyses, which takes a bunch of different studies and combines the data so we can have a more powerful look at what do the individual studies say. How do they combine to inform us what are better decisions for our lives? Researchers in Wales reviewed 22 different studies with around 29,000 people included in all of those different studies. They found that participating in activities that stimulate your mind reduces your risk of developing dementia to the extent where you can cut it in half. Half! <laughs> Another group of researchers from the UK looked at a total of 19 different studies across cultures. They were looking to see if mentally stimulating activities reduced dementia or cognitive decline, but they were also looking to see if it made your brain work better. And it did. They found that doing things that you were interested in improve your memory, your processing speed, and executive functions. Now, if you wanna get specific, we can look at a study based in the United States called the Bronx Aging Study. They followed almost 500 people aged 75 and older for up to 21 years. And these people, bless their hearts, <laughs> agreed to participate in these kind of time consuming and demanding things, looking at what they did, having clinical interviews and doing neuropsych testing to see how did their brain work over time. The researchers wanted to figure out the relationship between cognitively stimulating activities and dementia. They divided people's activities into six different groups. The groups included reading, writing, playing board games or card games, doing crossword puzzles, engaging in group discussions, and playing musical instruments. Each person got a point for doing any activity on any given day. Although they didn't track time, we can assume that you had to do it for maybe 15 minutes or more for it to count. For example, if you would read and play poker one day, you would get one point for reading and one point for playing poker. If you read seven days in a week, you get seven points. So this adds up so you could have multiple points in one day, depending on which activities you do or how many of them you do. What the researchers found was that people who were in the highest third of activities, so the people had, who had 11 or more points in any given week, compared to people who were in the lowest third, who didn't really do all that many activities in any given week, the people in that highest group had a 63% lowered risk of developing dementia. And this is from causes like Alzheimer's disease or vascular problems. Each time a person added one point for the week, so you do something once a week, one thing once a week, their risk of developing dementia decreased by 7%. Amazing. They think that this happens because of an idea called cognitive reserve. Now this concept doesn't have anything to do with the structure of your brain, what it looks like on structural imaging, or if they autopsy your brain after death, whether there's plaques and tangles or vascular damage and so on. But it has to do with the networks within your brain and how efficiently they're working. For example, I could go out and jog for a mile or two. It'd be a little slow, a little clunky. I could do it, I'd be working a little bit. But if you compared my performance to a trained runner who does this on a regular basis or perhaps competes in um, half marathons or marathons, their performance would be more efficient. It would be easier for them. Their heart rate and breathing would probably not go up as much as mine. More efficiency. The cool thing about cognitive reserve 
is that it's not a fixed level. It is the sum of your experiences throughout your lifetime. So things add up. Sure, there might be things like, well, what kind of education did you experience? How many years did you go to school? How, what kind of job did you have? How cognitively stimulating was it? But there are also things that contribute, like leisure activities, fun things that you do, things that you're interested in, your social networks. We can acquire these experiences throughout our lifespan and into later life. So how do we do this? Let's talk about real life. I have a three-tiered approach. So first, the things that we all are told to do, that many of us want to do, things that are really wonderful and exciting. We want to travel. We want to take classes. We want to learn languages. We want to play instruments. All these very high-level experiences. Of course you should do those. At any point that you are motivated, that you are able, that you can afford, that you can engage in any of these activities, please do. If you're already doing them, wonderful. Keep doing them. And in fact, even if you don't live near a university or a center that, that uh, has access to educational offerings and so on, there are so many resources online. Things like Skillshare, where you sign up for a pretty reasonable yearly fee, and then you have access to all of the educational classes and materials and all of the wonderful experts there. In fact, for Skillshare, I have a link below. If you click on it, you get a discount for signing up for the service. But we can't always be doing that top level of engagement and learning. There's things like, I don't have enough time to do some of those things, or I can't afford some of those things, or there's COVID and I'm not leaving the house to go travel the world and have new experiences. We can't always be doing them. So when that's the case, there is a medium level that I encourage for people. I advise to pick anything you like, anything at all, and start very simply. Once a month, you can slowly increase over time to maybe once a week, but once a month, schedule, put it on your calendar, because if you don't schedule it and put it on your calendar, you won't do it. Schedule something new or different. So this can be really anything. If you like cars, you can go to a car dealership, drive around, look at your favorite new cars and chat with somebody about it. If you like books and you want to read, go to the library, go online and pick out a new book and engage. Have fun with it. Tell people about it. I love birds and squirrels and pretty flowers and you know, things like that. So I could go to the Audubon Society. I haven't been for years and I could bring my smartphone. I can have a free app that tells me what is that bird based on the call that I'm hearing? Or what flower is that? Or I really like tree trunks and like cool bark. So what kind of tree is that? I mean, how awesome. I could go do that and be fun and be something different. But even more simplistic, at a micro level, my third tier is that every single day you can do something new. When you walk up to the door, use your non-dominant hand to open it. Or use your non-dominant hand to brush your teeth or comb your hair or feed yourself. If you go for a walk, walk in a new area. Look at something new. The other day I was looking at roofs. It was ridiculous. I don't know why I was looking at roofs. But I started looking at them and they're different and there's weird things poking out of them. <laughs> When you're driving, take one turn early and try to figure out how to get home. If you can't figure it out, figure out how to use your GPS. When you go to the grocery store, learn your checker's name and try to remember it or learn something about them. If somebody gives you food, rather than going, oh, what is it? Touch it, taste it, smell it, experience it, and see if you can figure it out. What's the base that they use? What spices or different style of preparing it was used? But the ultimate, tonight, when you sit down for dinner, sit in a different place. Ah! <laughs> I mean, literally, your body's gonna be like, no, put me back, this is horrible. Because we're not used to mild, minor changes in our environment like that. And they're really good for us. 
So every single day I have a word of the day app. I like words and it's a word of the day app. And so every day I get some new unusual word and it says it for me so I can hear how to pronounce it. And then I try to sneak it in when I'm talking to people. And it's obnoxious. You know, these are weird words. People don't use those real words in conversation, but it's kind of fun <laughs> to sneak it in and see if anybody notices. So very small action can use your brain in new ways and promote this idea of cognitive reserve. So now you're armed with the idea of why you should do this and different things that you can do. Doing one thing a week reduces your chance of dementia by 7%. Comment below to tell us what you're doing this week to inspire the rest of us. Also, share this with people you love, people who might benefit from this. This is the start of a very exciting series, digging through the ideas of how do we develop our own or find our own experience of curiosity in the world to use our brains, promote this idea of cognitive reserve, and live better, happier lives. I can't wait to do it with you.